After the discussion we had last time about the RL revelation, it felt like we needed a solid ground to proceed in order to effectively utilize RL, more specifically RLVR, which is short for reinforcement learning with verifiable rewards. If you want a more detailed introduction, I highly recommend you to watch my last video, but in general, it is just the idea of training a model towards a behavior through an environment that can be systematically verified like math and coding so you can scale up the learning process pretty easily. However, this system is just too ambiguous in a way that after all the process things, all the chain of thoughts, and all the tokens generated, you're telling me the reward signal is just simple 0 or 1 over all these actions. How is the model going to know which part of this process was a pivotal point that decided the final outcome? So this single end of trajectory reward is basically spread across thousands of mostly trivial tokens, making the feedback signal incredibly diluted while slowing down the learning. Which brings us to the key problem of RLVR that we would need to solve. That is the reward assignment precision. The optimized we need a way to spotlight the high impact tokens where the model actually makes choices instead of spreading gradients uniformly across boilerplate context. So the researchers use a pretty simple method that is by measuring the entropy. And before we dive into how entropy works in LLMs, with how RL is now perfecting LLM applications like agentic use, having an actual clean SDK that can support your agentic development easily is also as important. And that's why I want to put a free and open source toolkit on your radar called the strands agents. This is an open source SDK that takes a model driven approach to build and run AI agents in just a few lines of code and it was open sourced by AWS in May 2025 with hundreds of thousands of downloads. And in July 2025, the team shipped updates that make multi-agent systems crazy simple. They introduced built-in patterns like swarms, graphs, and handoffs plus support for agent to agent protocol so agents across platforms can talk to each other with this new concept concept called model-driven orchestration. It lets developers get ideas prototype faster by offloading the cognitive burden of planning to the model, so developers can focus more on how the model should define success while still retaining higher level control of the workflow. And this is made possible with their multi-agents SDK, with human agent transfers, swarms for self-organizing expert teams, and graph workflows for auditable flows. Strand agents let the model plan, pick tools, and reflect easily. Additionally, it lets you easily swap between Amazon Bedrock, OpenAI, Anthropic, and local models without the need to change any of her code. And of course, it has the best in-class AWS integrations. While Strand supports running in any cloud environment, it comes with simple-to-use integrations with AWS services like Bedrock Agent Core and EKS for running the agent and its tools, Dynamo Database and S3 for storage and memory, and many more. But what's the best thing about Strand is that all these are completely free to use. The code, the docs, and the demos are all under GitHub, now setting at 2.8k stars, so definitely give it a try now using the link down in the description, and thank you AWS for sponsoring this video. Anyways, entropy is basically a single number that tells you how uncertain a probability distribution is. The more evenly the probabilities are spread, the higher the entropy. So you can use the same logic to measure entropy for every token that is being generated by an LLM, since an autoregressive LLM is basically using tokens of up to the position t to predict the token t plus 1 from a vocabulary of, let's say, 128k tokens, which is a common size for models nowadays. With this, we can then calculate the entropy for every generated token with this formula. So if one of the vocabulary has a probability of 100%, then entropy is 0 bit, and if the distribution is uniform across all 128k vocabularies, then the entropy could be up to 17 bits. And because the scale of entropy is logarithmic, moving up one bit of entropy basically doubles the effective number of equally likely options, so a uniform distribution is basically basically 2 to the power of 17, which roughly equates to 131k tokens. But entropy values above 8 bits are rare because the context window would usually rule out most tokens. So a quick rule of thumb is that if entropy is less than 1, then 90% of the probability is on one token, which means the model is pretty certain about the next word. If entropy is around 1 to 3, there are a handful of tokens each sitting at more than 5%, which means the model sees quite a small set of plausible continuations to branch out to. And if entropy is larger than 4, then there are a tons of words with less than 3% probability, which means the model has no strong preference or the continuation is very uncertain. So with those high entropy spikes, the researchers are able to potentially locate where the model is thinking the most because this pivotal point usually determines what comes next, and as you can see in this visualization where blue is low entropy and red is high entropy, most of the tokens that come after a slightly red token are all blues, which implies the trajectory is mostly decided by the red tokens as the blue ones were really easy 
easy to determine. So newer RLVR methods exploit this property to turn a general end reward into a finer learning signal. But even though we have these entropy wave points now, there are still completely different directions that researchers can approach this problem. So in this research paper published by Quinn called Beyond the 80-20 Rule, they explore the idea of what if they simply have to model stop learning on the 80% least uncertain tokens. More specifically, in every token generation where the entropy falls in the bottom 80%, its loss would be hard set to zero, providing zero learning updates. So for token generations that are less than 0.672 entropy, they will all be ignored. This graph you're looking at is log scaled, by the way, so it is a bit confusing at first glance. This means the tokens like maybe, actually, suppose, and wait would be tokens that are usually high entropy, and tokens like radius, asian, sin, term, ed, type, and all kinds of closing brackets would usually be low entropy. Before we get any further, we still haven't really proved quantitatively that entropy is the pivotal point that will impact a model's correctness, even though there is a distinct and observable pattern which potentially supports the idea of a forking token. So doing anything that targets the forking token does not guarantee performance yet. So the researchers at Quinn did an experiment. Remember the temperature hyperparameter that you can control when using LLMs like Gemini? Well, temperature basically lets you decide how much randomness to inject when you sample from a distribution. So by benchmarking the performance of the tokens in the 80th percentile on varying temperature, and let's refer to them as non-forking tokens, with the top 20%, which we will now refer to as forking tokens at a constant temperature of one, versus a varying temperature of the forking tokens with the non-forking tokens temperature set at one, it shows that keeping the non-forking tokens lower temperature than forking tokens would always be better, and this is proven across the board. On top of that, when forking tokens temperature is set at two and non-forking tokens temperature is set at one, it starts to perform better than the baseline, which means the model would benefit more when non-forking tokens are suppressed or at least the less random than the forking tokens. And surprisingly, the accuracy even outperforms the baseline when the forking tokens have a temperature of two. So once again, the general idea here is that increasing entropy across all tokens uniformly can degrade performance by disrupting the low entropy non-forking tokens, making RL generate feedback on all tokens a suboptimal move. On the other hand, selectively increasing the entropy of high entropy forking tokens can indeed drive performance. So with the effectiveness of forking tokens being proven, Quinn researchers implemented a way of only updating the model when encountering the forking tokens. They basically used 80% less back props and can total up to 50% less flops to gain 7% to 11% accuracy on Amy and Math for Quinn 332B, thanks to the optimizer now being able to concentrate signals exactly where the key reasoning crossroad is. So the model is able to lock in and give the feedback based on the pivotal points. But let's go back to this graph again, and like I mentioned before, when the forking tokens are at temperature 2 and non-forking at 1, the performance in general is just better, isn't it? Then maybe instead of silencing the 80% non-forking tokens, why don't we just amplify the learning of the forking tokens? So in this other paper called Reasoning with Exploration and Entropy Perspective, the researchers kept every token feedback alive but adds a tiny bonus to the PPO and GRPO advantage whenever a token's entropy rises above of a moving baseline. This bonus works because it turns each high entropy token into a tiny side quest. And how it works is that during each RLVR training sampling, it'll mark any token whose entropy is above the running average, as we already know those are the real decision points. And after grading the rollout, every mark token will be given a tiny extra bonus, so the model will more likely to pass through the same uncertain spots again when running the same sample. This prevents the model from just collapsing onto that one option forever, so future sampling can revisit the same spot and try out different alternatives. This process repeats where branches that lead to a correct final answer will keep getting the bonus and grow, while dead end branches slowly shrink based on the binary signal. Then once a branch consistently succeeds, entropy at that token would drop below the threshold along with the bonus vanishing and the exploration there would just naturally disappear. This is like a natural recursive process of improving explorations within RLVR, which is fascinating to see. And if you look at the performance where you simply turn on the bonus, even though within the first 32 tries it underperforms the baseline, but once it tries more than 32 times up to past 126, the trained model is now able to solve much more diverse problems, kind of like breaking the shrinking behavior curse which the standard RL method would create as we also discussed in the last RL video. But if you are too lazy to watch it, it just refers to how RLVR applied onto LLM only boosts the most common behavior which makes these models more shallow and less diverse.
diverse at solving questions that require creativity. Hence the reason why when you sample something so many times, it only gives you that handful of response. But here, not only does the model have more diversity than the baseline, it is also able to on average outperform the baseline across major math benchmarks. So by rewarding the model to explore all the branches, it shows that the model now generates more distinct correct proofs instead of just repeating one favorite derivation. On the other hand, the chain of thought process is also longer and more complete. The average solution length grows by 25 to 30 percent, and manual inspection by the researchers confirmed that the extra steps are genuine intermediate reasoning, not filler, indicating the bonus reward keeping alternative branches alive long enough to find fuller solutions before entropy naturally collapses. So by utilizing entropy as a wave point to more precisely train a model seems like a great idea, as this gives the simple binary signal a stronger steering power to improve. So how well you can control RL learning on a fine grain level is probably the next big direction of RLVR. As to how to utilize this entropy, these two papers we covered today both propose some interesting early ideas that might just be the foundation of the new RLVR era. What do you think? Let me know down in comments. And if you like today's research breakdown, definitely check out my newsletter where I cover the latest and the juiciest research weekly. On it, I will usually cover the best research papers from the previous week. So if you don't want to miss out, definitely go and subscribe. And thank you guys for watching. A big shout out to Andrew Laschelius, Chris Ledoux, Degan, News Research, Kanan, Robert Zaviasa, Louis Muck, Ben Shainer, Marcelo Ferraria, Zane Sheep, Poof and Inu, DX Research Group, and many others that support me through Patreon or YouTube. Follow me on Twitter if you haven't, and I'll see y'all in the next one.